Welcome to my Bob Thurman podcast. I'm so grateful some good friends enabled me to present them to you. If you enjoy them and find them useful, please think of becoming a member of Tibet House US to help preserve Tibetan culture. Tibet House is the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. All best wishes. Have a great day. This is episode number 14, titled, How the Vajrayana and Tantra Works. This is the Tibetan yogis, and Indian originally, actually, a Buddhist, Indian Buddhist yogis, way of dividing what is called the gross, subtle, and extremely subtle body and mind. And um, the gross one, or coarse one, is our ordinary regular body, five elements and five sense organs. And then the mind are the six sense consciousnesses that coordinate the perceptions and the experiences of these five senses. And the mind is an inner sense that aligns itself with visual or audio or smell or taste or touch, etc., and coordinates them and then goes and, and retrieves concepts from the memory to organize what one perceives. And uh, but that's the growth of body-mind. And then the subtle one is the central nervous system, uh, which are called the nadis or channels. The, the subtle body, this is. The subtle energies, like the circulate, not just breathing energy, but circulatory energy in the bloodstream, heart pumping, uh, neural energy, nerve impulses, like a seemingly electrical type of things going through the nervous system. Um, and it, uh, you know, lymphatic system, all, all the circulatory system of the body, the different energies, and the senses also. And then the, neuro, the neurotransmitters or neurodrops, what they call tigli, uh, bindu, uh, that's the subtle body, and the subtle mind are three intuitive no- knowledges that are layers of light, white light, red light, uh, brilliant red light, calm moonlight uh, type white light, red light, and a dark lit space, which have 80 instinct- instinctual patterns in them for normal beings, and which are normally perceived by such normal beings, sometimes falling asleep or fainting, passing out, and definitely are dying at the time of death. And uh, then the clear light mind and the subtle, super subtle wind energy at the heart center is the extremely subtle body mind. And in a way, they are the same. So you can materialistically reductionize mind into energy. You can mentalistically reductionize energy into mind at the extremely subtle level. But it's still made in a dualistic thing like body mind just for sort of understanding. But actually, that's sort of the area of Buddha mind. And everyone experiences that what's called clear light or transparency would be a better term for it because it's not a bright light. It's, um, it's just a transparent sort of thing like a jewel, like a diamond or a glass, something like that. And it has a grayish color analogy to it, not a bright white or red light. And um, it's a light. In other words, everything is sort of illuminated by itself. And no light shines from one thing on another there, but, and so everything is transparent and there are no shadows. It's sort of the area where dark energy and light energy kind of meet, you could say, and it is the deepest energy of the universe, supposedly. And the only being who is sustainably conscious at that level, from that level, is a Buddha. That's the definition of a Buddha. And every being goes through that super subtle state at the time of death and rebirth, but the ordinary being never notices being there because it just sort of goes by in a flash because that ordinary being is instinctually trying to maintain a separated body-mind complex and find another body, you know, so they don't notice this sort of place where there's, where they're sort of infinitesimal and infinite at the same time, subject and object are the same things, mind and matter are the same things. It's kind of an indescribable experience, something like that. But it's kind of not noticed by really all be ordinary beings kind of notice is going unconscious in the uh, bottom luminance, which is called imminence, which is the dark lit uh, sky of the three skies, you know, and which is elaborated in the next. There's an empty sky pervaded by white moonlight with 33 instincts related to desire and lust. An empty sky pervaded by red sunlight, 40 instinctual surges related to anger and aggression. And... Um, and fear and this kind of thing. And then finally, empty sky pervaded by radiant darkness with seven instinctual surges sort of relating to going unconscious, really, sleep and unconsciousness and this type of thing. 
And that's really where people think they land in sleep or death. But according to the Buddhists, they don't. And that's just a, that's a threshold state for the clear light state. But the ordinary person never perceives or is really unaware of the clear light state, usually. Okay, so that's the reason I'm saying this is because this scheme of understanding the body-mind complex for the Buddhist tantric yogis is what is involved in what we're going to describe today, the perfection stage or completion stage of unexcelled yoga tantra. Uh, and those who were here last time, it doesn't hurt to go over it again. There are these different stages that are organized here at the basis path. Basis means ordinary reality. Path means when you're in the process of transforming that ordinary reality into an enlightenment reality. And result or fruition is where you enter, the, you become a Buddha and enter enlightened reality. So at the most ordinary stage, you have your gross body mind, your subtle body mind, your extremely subtle body mind, which correspond to your waking state, your dreaming state, where your dream, your dream experience is you actually moving around in your, in your subtle body mind, but you experience it as creating an environment as a sort of, as a sort of knockoff of the core state, but you, know, you have this body, dream body. And uh, the extremely subtle body mind, again, one normally doesn't notice, and therefore deep sleep is connected to that and dreaming and waking. And now, so the ordinary three states are the waking, dreaming, and the deep sleep. And then these connect to the ordinary life states, and then between state and death. Then in the, what's called the creation stage, which are the things that um, Indian and Tibetan full-fledged Buddhism from 500 you know, a conscious literary culture from around 500 of the common era to 1,000, although according to its own claim, it comes from Buddha's time, uh, so 1,500 years, but it was kept truly esoteric until around 500, 600. And uh, <clears throat> so the creation stage of Unexcel Yoga Tantra, these, the life state corresponds to assuming the form of a deity in the mandala, because in this extraordinary visualization type imaginative construction, one reviews and revisions the world in a different way to create a kind of ideal world within which one will have the confidence and the sense of security to unfold one's sensitivity in a certain way. And also visualizing the world in that way allows the central nervous system to open its knots and things and not be afraid of its own inner sensitivities and sensations. And then the dreaming state is some parts of the of the meditations that one, the visualized type of meditations that one does, which have sort of active sequences. And that's like a dream or like a between in the, in the path. And then the meditation on emptiness uh, is so that one, when one goes into sort of that, the, the, dissolution, the death dissolution process, which one does meditatively to go in and out of being in the mandala and the deity form, one interconnects that with voidness or emptiness. And this author wrote emptiness. I always call it voidness. But uh, the clear light of the void is, uh, is where one, one sort of merges into. And that's similar to death and deep sleep. And because the real state of death is not some dark state or oblivion state. It's this, this infinite consciousness of clear light, actually, but which is disconnected from any embodiment or location or <clears throat> you know, special place apart from some other place. It sort of merges with everything type of thing. So that's why the ordinary untrained mind person can't perceive it, because they're only into perceiving something from an enclosed perspective, with, and what they're perceiving is something else in a dualistic way, and the clear light mind is not like that. Then the perfection stage, which was the topic today and we will get to, is this um, extraordinary thing of where, having been in the meditative states, one enters the ordinary course, re-enters it, having been out of it in a kind of what they call a magic body or a deity body, and then arising as the illusion body or magic body, and then dissolving into the indestructible drop. That's that perfection stage. And these result in Buddhahood time to you know, manifesting a Buddha embodiment. And then there is this concept in Buddhism, which if you have studied, you know, there are said to be three bodies of Buddha, you know, first two and then three, uh, which are a truth body, or I prefer to call it reality body, dharmakaya, means the infinite body of a Buddhahood, Buddha. So when you become a Buddha, according to Mahayana Buddhists, you have an experience that you are an infinite everything in the universe, but not an infinite everything in a way of where you're, you're all of it and it's all not there, and you're not there. So it's just some kind of blank everything. Not that, 
but rather where you are everything in all of its details, and that is the absolute. You and, and you are all the other beings, which is a rather trying way to be. They say a Buddha is like the mother, is like a being who considers and feels automatically and spontaneously every living being the way a mother feels her only beloved child to be worrying about all beings like they were your only beloved child. Luckily, Buddha can do that because he has this beatific body, which is, perceives all those beings as actually made out of bliss because the, the clear light, infinite energy of the clear light of the void is actually bliss in the sense that it is total fulfilled. There's no wanting. There's no nothing. It's just complete melted into this infinity, and there's no, um, n- no dissatisfaction and no problem. And uh, it perceives every being as just configurations of this clear light of bliss. So fine. But unfortunately, it also, because it is, it feels it's one with all those beings, it perceives them from within themselves, so to speak, the Buddha's reality body. And by perceiving them from within themselves, it notices that they within themselves feel they're having a miserable time. And they really don't have enough. And it's really unfortunate. And they're afraid of this and that. And they're growing old and they're dying and they're getting sick and they're losing their friends and they're meeting their enemies. And it's just really tough for them because they're in this unrealistic... Uh, they're, they're, their reality is an ignorance-driven reality where they think they are this one thing sort of fending off the, or trying to incorporate and, and gobble up the entire universe. And they're failing to do it. And the universe is really rather gobbling them, mostly. So you feel that when you're a Buddha, and, and you want to be able to get them to understand that they are the whole universe just like you, and that's a blissful way of being, and they don't even have to die to do that, but they incorporate sort of the transcendent death thing in their life state and in a, in a way of bliss, and then they become part of the... They automatically connect to all other beings in the same way as you do. And, uh, but the problem is you can't just sort of since you are them, and then you, that means you see them in both ways, where you, see, you feel them as a bliss, as configuration of bliss, but you also feel them as they feel themselves, as a misery, a bag of misery, and you can't just sort of be the bliss part of them and overwhelm the misery part, because the misery part will fight you off. <laughs> it's like people, I know people like that, some sort of existentialist and things. They think, no, you can't take my suffering, you know. That's my, gives me my meaning. They're all into things like that, people. Like, oh, yeah, we need our suffering. And so if it's, like, it's like giving a paranoiac a hug. They think you're there to smother them or something. You know? That's a very bad idea to rush up with a big abrazo. Oh, amigo mio, the paranoid. Ah! And especially if you're coming from within, because you feel you are them, you're going to like emanate the bliss of their cells to the misery of their mind, then they would think they're about to give birth to the alien and they would have a complete freak out. Something's bursting out from within them. They'd really be upset because they're victims of what Bill Hamrai called the emotional plague and they can't bear to experience their own feelings. So first thing, since this is the perfection stage time, I wanted to read, a, this is a book that I translated, uh, written by the great uh, Leonardo of Tibet, Lama Dzongkhapa, uh, Lausanne Dakwa, his name, who lived uh, 1357 to 1419. And in it, it's called The Brilliant, uh, Brilliantly Illuminating Lamp. Actually, I mistitled it at the last minute like an idiot. I call it Brilliant Illumination of the Lamp, which I would like to refine to Brilliantly Illuminating Lamp. And I'm not going to explain why, but I did that. I overshot, let's say. And uh, it's talking here about what's called the perfection stage. And the perfection stage, it's a, it's a study of that. It's called the lamp of the five stages. And the perfection stage is said to have five stages, although different authorities within the tradition define those five in different ways. But usually they're defined, one way they define it is something called body isolation, speech isolation, mind isolation. Uh, uh, then there is clear light and... Um, then there is what's called, what I call communion. Other people call union, integration. I used to call it integration. And those are five, uh, the five stages. And the communion stage, half of it is Buddhahood itself, and half of it is really on the verge of Buddhahood. Uh, and it's called the metaphoric Buddhahood, and then there's actual objective Buddhahood. 
And then, and then the third one, which is called mind isolation, sort of has two or three substages in it, which one of which is called mind objective, and one of which is called magic body, or superficial reality, relative reality, you could say. Uh, and uh, so the third stage is a very pivotal kind of stage, and uh, has sort of more stages in it in order to come up with the number five. Then another way it's done is where the body isolation is connected with the whole of the creation stage. And Anixal Yoga Tantra has two stages, one called creation stage, which is imaginative creativity going on, where you create a different mandala universe from this universe, and a different body of yourself, and a different self-identity of yourself than your ordinary one, in which you transmute your setting from ordinary to extraordinary. And, um, and that which is why, you know, which is what's esoteric, because you really do create a different universe, which for a person who didn't have initially the understanding of voidness, which means the understanding that all ways of experiencing the universe are somehow mental constructions, are somehow imagined, like even being in this room as we are imagining this room, which doesn't mean there aren't atoms and concretes and energies that are configured in a certain way here, but it means that when we perceive it in this shape, we are imposing our concepts of pillars and roofs and floors and ultimately, and if we know about subtler science, we have atoms and, and such things, and, uh, and gravity and heaven knows what, depending on what our analysis of reality is. And so in a way, we are imagining our world, which doesn't mean that it's only just in our mind, but we are all mutually imagining it, and there are deities imagining it, and there are demons imagining it, and animals and cockroaches and all. We're all mutually imagining a way, imagining up a storm. <laughs> and so... The creation stage is where, by knowing voidness or emptiness or selflessness, we have deepened our understanding of not their non-existence of everything, but our understanding of the fact that the way things are, the way they're shaped, we are responsible partially, we and other beings are responsible in that mind shapes matter in a certain way. But it isn't just one's own mind. It's not solipsism where you can just change your mind and that'll change everything because other minds will still be holding things in a certain way. So it's a matter of the mutual intersection of infinite numbers of minds that shape things the way they are. So therefore, in the most high form of, of Buddhist thought, of Buddhist science, they prefer to deal with external objects as if they were external objects. The mentalist form, where they mentalistically reduce all of things to mind, is not considered the highest form. Uh, because it can trap people in a kind of mental place, you know, through, when they become meditative, uh, and then that's not good. So, but anyway, when one realizes that, then the way of dealing with the world becomes where you realize that you are shaping it by how you are predisposed to see it. So you're completely aware of your, of your not just prejudice in a sort of coarse way like sexism or nationalism or chauvinism or something or religious fanaticism, but at a deeper level... Uh, you know, your, your notion of materialism or material objects, subject-object duality, all this kind of thing. You are structuring that. And so you're, you're, and you're contributing to a kind of a collective imagination, namely a culture, where whatever the way you see it is, does have some resonance with how others see it. And I think this, this people realize without Buddhism, like Shelley famously said, that the poet Shelley, British poet Shelley, said that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of mankind, he said. And the way that a Buddhist would understand that is that he grasped the idea that a poet has a new way of imagining things. They break through their conventional characterization of the flower or the dewdrop or, you know, Emily Dickinson sees the lamps of the streets of heaven in the dewdrops that are... Other people just see some evaporating water. And... Uh, and, but then by doing that, they then create new terms of perception. And then people begin, they read that, and then this, this spreads in the culture, and then people begin to have more subtle in terms of perception. So that legislates their way of relating to reality, I think is what, he's, what he meant. Because poets kind of are those who realize the mandric quality of language, that is, that language does create the world, or at least shapes it in a certain way. So, uh, okay... So, so that's that's uh, so. Therefore, then, once one realizes that, then it, one becomes responsible to the art of imagining the world a little bit better. One doesn't just accept that, and also one gets a more powerful imagination because the routinized imagination that doesn't realize I'm imagining that pillar, 
and I'm making the perception of the light reflecting off that surface fit with my idea of the pillar in this room. I'm making my interaction with other beings, say someone I know who has a certain role that I'm used to them behaving in a certain way, I automatically project that they always behave that way and I don't notice other aspects of them because we, you know, we recognize things that is to say we fit them in our predisposed ideas and then they have to just be whatever we pre preconceive them to be. And therefore, understanding of voidness or emptiness is not at all some nihilistic thing of like, do whatever you feel like. It actually brings you around to realizing that that voidness is the interrelated web of relativity. And because it is void in the sense that it is not intrinsically whatever it appears to you to be, you are involved in shaping how it is by how you are seeing it. And therefore, one thing you can do about things is see them in a different way, and that will help change them. And, uh, and so then the burden is on you a little bit to, you know, as Dalai Lama says, world peace through inner peace. You know, if you're perceiving enemies, enemies everywhere and you're armed to the teeth and supporting being armed to the teeth because there's all these evil people, then you create, you're helping, you're contributing to creating a situation like that. For example, I mean, that's a very coarse and gross example, but much more subtle than that. Okay? So that's the thing. Then, so then you, then otherwise you see the creation stage where you create this, uh, you reshape the whole world to be this purified mandala realm. All of the other beings in it are already enlightened beings, and they're just manifesting as ordinary beings to just like, if you're a teacher even, if you're, they ask you a question, it's just to get you to help yourself understand rather than them, because they're already all Buddhas and, and uh, male and female Buddhas, all other beings. And um, the world is already this crystal palace you know, of, the, of perfect uh, fulfillment. And uh, the time is the ultimate time, and everybody else is a Buddha. And so there's nothing imperfect in the world. And then you also, your body is actually this, this idealized dream body, like you might have, if you're in a tough space, they're dealing with some hard characters. You might have 20 arms or something on either side, and hundreds of heads looking in all directions, eyes in the back of your head, literally faces in the back of your head. You might have really powerful strength radiating from your, your eyes when they would flash, would radiate supernova flames, you know, be standing on a plane of nuclear fusion, <laughs> something like that. I mean, all kind of extraordinary imaginations. And you feel like that. Therefore, you feel very secure, calm, and, uh, and strong, and confident, therefore, that you can internally feel your deepest feelings. And uh, there won't be a danger to you or anyone, and you don't have to fear anything of anyone. So that's what the mandala universe is. But if you didn't know emptiness, and you somehow got into it because you know you had some sort of faith in a leader or some cult or something, and they said, "Now you're perfect, and you're Buddha, and all this," and then you go around, "I'm Buddha," like, "Don't give me a parking ticket," you know, "Don't don't ask me to like do this or that," you know, you become kind of a megalomaniac if you didn't know about emptiness. If you know about emptiness, you realize as extraordinary as you may be able to transform yourself to feel, it is just a self-construction. Just like when you normally go around feeling like, don't drop a piano on me from the construction site here. Yeah, that's your normal sort of paranoid, don't stub my toe feeling that you run around the world in, feeling anxious about something's going to happen to you. Because you know? a lot of things did happen to you, right? A lot of people did step on your toe and you stubbed it many. I stubbed my toes a lot of times. So, so that, that's the creation stage. Then within that creation stage, then one goes into the uh, processes of developing awareness down this ladder. And actually, this particular set of schemes don't show the, what the Book of the Dead does, where you go down out of the coarse body, you know, the stages of earth into water, water into fire, fire into wind, wind or energy, energy into consciousness or space, then the, into moonlight, sunlight, dark light, and clear light. So there's called the eight stages of dissolution. And, um, and so one goes into yoga, so the perfection stage, where one learns to do that. And one learns that um, to remain conscious in those things. It's sort of like, like training yourself to lucidly dream. You know, probably some of you here, I wouldn't be surprised if you do know how to do that, and they, or you have lucid dreams sometimes, I wouldn't be surprised. And uh, it's not that hard to learn to do that. It's, there's, you know, some universities have, have studied that, REM sleep, and then all this lucid dreaming. Charles Tart did a lot of interesting experiments like that, a California psychologist. And, um, 
And then people teach it in the sort of alternative world. They teach uh, lucid dreaming. And so that this is lucid developing, lucid kind of waking dream through samadhi or one-pointed concentration relating to developing the skill and ability to lucidly die and to go into the subtle after-death state while sit without dying, but by le- and leaving the coarse body, actually, and leaving the body in a kind of what they call cataleptic trance, where it sort of hibernates and just sits there or whatever. That, I don't really know. I never did myself. Maybe it tumbles over. I'm not sure. <laughs> or they, they sit in boxes, some of those yogis, or they have straps that they, they bind themselves with so that when they are not in the body or something, it stays upright. They have things like that. And... Uh, I haven't unfortunately taken you because because you can't really do that until you have attained in the exoteric Buddhism some degree of shamatha or complete one point instability, and you have the bodhisattva mind, and you have the free, little bit freedom from your instinctual surges and drives, so you don't get caught up in aggression or lust uh, in, when you get into the unconscious, so to speak, uh, and you and then you learn this this uh, subtle body, the schemes, you know, of, of how to do that. So here. Um, it's talking about bliss now. Oh, yes. Now, the key of, of course, the thing is, is bliss. There is only one realization of voidness, of ultimate reality, because there's only one ultimate reality. There's no different tantric ultimate reality and, and sutric or exoteric and esoteric ultimate reality. And the mother of all Buddhas is that ultimate reality, which is called transcendent wisdom, as we read the sutra of her. She is the wisdom that knows the nature of of freedom. Voidness really means freedom, freedom from any kind of stuck or non-relational structure within relativity. It also means relativity, but it sort of de- it relativizes all supposed absolutes is what voidness does. Everything is empty or devoid of any absolute essence of that thing that makes it the thing. Things are only the things that they are, and people are only the people they are out of sheer relationality with every other thing. That's what it means. So that's why she's the mother of all Buddhas, Prajnaparamita. And that's only one understanding. There's no different tantric It's not like Buddha withheld the great understanding for the people in the esoteric thing because the other people weren't ready for it. No. But, and, the, and that, that understanding of ultimate reality or ultimate reality itself has the connotation of, of being female. The male connotation is the connotation of the subjectivity that realizes that reality. And in the exoteric teaching, the subjectivity of that is the coarse subjectivity, which is the intellect, and that intellect then empowered by one-pointed mental understanding. But still, in a way, it's, it's a conscious process where that is understood. And uh, although when you know, it's deeply understood, it goes more than conscious, but it's really generated by the conscious rational mind, uh, and which kind of catapults beyond itself when it really when it really takes a grip on something. Just like when you eat an apple, your conscious, rational mind sees the nice apple, no worms in it, and you, you buy an organic apple, of course, because you're hip enough to come to Tibet house, so you eat organic apples only. <laughs> and you even wash it, even though it's said to be organic. And then you take a bite. So your reason brings you right up to where you really want to munch down that apple. But the munching is beyond reason. It's inconceivable. No one can describe it. Even poets can only say a little bit about that delicious munch of that gala apple, whatever it is. It's like beyond. So similarly, uh, that, that, but it's still coming out of, the, let's say, the coarse mind-body structure. Then the tantric understanding is with a different subjectivity. So it's one mother, different fathers. And actually, even they say, three, there's three fathers, actually, <laughs> The Theravada, or dualistic Buddhism, the father there is a kind of wisdom that doesn't have bodhisattva idea of bringing all beings into enlightenment with you. So it's kind of a self-seeking of your own personal nirvana, and it's this wisdom of the, of the arhat, you know, that comes and understands emptiness, but understands it, or voidness understands it. Then the bodhisattva one understands it in a different way, more directly as relativity, because they don't indulge in the idea that Nirvana is going to be some place they personally can go and get away from it all. They realize that nirvana is the relativity of them and all the beings, so they have to bring all the other beings into it with them, which becomes the bodhisattva vow. So that's a different male, different, a different father, is the bodhisattva subjectivity. And then the tantric one is yet a different subjectivity. And then this is what is 
the subtle or super subtle subjectivity, actually. And or subtle and super subtle, let's say, because there and the and the super subtle and subjectivity is bliss subjectivity. And and that's very logical, actually, if you think about it. How can you know most deeply that which is beyond objectivity? You know, the ultimate, which cannot be a relational object in a way. So the absolute cannot be a relational object, or it wouldn't be absolute. And yet they say you know it. But, in a, but they say that because there is a transformative experience where you kind of know what it is intuitively, but it is not a subject-object dualistic knowledge. And so how can you ultimately nearly know that full force, full on? You melt into it because it is you. It is your cognitive apparatus itself. It isn't like you, you have a knowledge and, oh, I, oh, that's ultimate, that's absolute. Oh, it's emptiness is over there. Or I disappeared. So since I disappeared, I must have realized emptiness. As a lot of people get misled into thinking. What is the experience of melting like? We call it bliss. We let go of everything. And when we happily do so, it's because it's a bliss to do so. And of course, from the Buddhist physiological point of view, that bliss is, we call, that's, we call, we call that orgasm. And so the super subtle mind, but, but our normal orgasms with our whole structure is very minimal compared to what is called orgasmic bliss. So the, the orgasm is an analogy for something much deeper than a genitally organized orgasm, let's call it, in a, in, with, a, with respect to Freud. It's much deeper than that, but it's like that. And that is a kind of melting also, of course. But it's just, and the only problem with it is it's usually, it doesn't melt you enough. And then there's that usual, there's the aftermath with a lot of problems usually. So, so it's like we, even people are nervous about it. But um, although the French are hip, at least they're, they're French. They call it le petit mot, the little death, they call it. And, um, but, but the true bliss, so the subjectivity of bliss is what realizes, when it realizes emptiness, that's Buddhahood. Is, a non, is the true non-dual communion. I call it communion, integration, or communion or union experience of Buddhahood. Yuga Nada, it is called, or Sungjuk in Tibetan. And that's what the perfection stage, that's the fifth stage of the perfection stage. And that's what is, is coming, is, is leading, that's what, what the perfection stage is leading up to. Body isolation is where the body, all physical perceptions are isolated from perceiving anything as ordinary. Therefore, in a way, it's a culmination of the creation stage where the ordinary, is trans the ordinary of objects is transmuted into the mandala, the ordinary of the subjectivity is transmuted from a, from a non-enlightened identity to a Buddha identity, and, but, but in an imaginative way, still conceptuality is operating there. And then body isolation is that where that becomes like visceral and one perceives one's body as sort of made of subatomic Buddhas, something like that. They're like Buddhas in every subatomic particle, uh, subatomic energies. And that's body isolation, so that one doesn't see like an ordinary hand with flesh and bone and finger, etc. One sees like a, a, a swarm of Buddhas in, as one's hand. And that's, a, that's called body isolation. And then uh, speech isolation is where, uh, through recitation of mantra, but this is a special kind of mantra, which I'm going to show you those in illustrations, so I'll come back to it. And speech isolation is where mantra and breathing become the same thing. So that when, when inhale, there are different versions of it, but the most normal one is when you inhale is om, which means that your inhalation, the energy that comes with inhalation and the wind of the inner part of the inhalation is uh, the bodies of all Buddhas, because om is the embodiment of all Buddhas. And of course, that embodiment includes the reality body of all Buddhas, which is everything. So the Om is somehow celebrating that every element, everything in every atom and the air and you and, and your chest and lungs, and it's all Buddha's body. So Om is, when you just inhale, is Om. When you turn from inhaling to exhaling in that tiny catch, which actually when you practice you hold a little bit, you hold it, the, the energy at the heart center, and then... Uh, that, that is ah, a long ah with the ah sound at the end. And that is the speech of all Buddhas. And when you exhale, it's hung. And, and the om is diamond white, and the ah is or crystal white. The ah is ruby red, and the hung is sapphire blue. 
And, but you're not, it's not like when you breathe in, you're thinking om sort of riding on the breath or you're muttering om on inhalation, like om, like that. Just the breathing is om. Just the catching of the breath is ah. Just the exhalation is hum. And when that happens, you're in and out Breathing is just the kind of the circulation of body, speech, and mind of all Buddhas. So that language, which at root is mantra, creativity, is seen as uh, non-dual from reality. And, that, and, your, and your extraordinary reality of the imminent presence in every aspect of your life cycle uh, is the body, speech, and mind of all Buddhas. That's called speech isolation. And that culminates in what is called the opening of the central channel, where the coarse nervous system and the neurotransmitters that are normally scattered throughout what are called the 72,000 small channels or nerves throughout the body all condense into the central channel. And they go out of even the two other axial channels, the red right one and the white left one. And they all go into the central channel, into the center of the different chakras. And, and then this, uh, when that happens, that's called mind isolation or mind objective. And when that happens, which is a very, very deep experience, is when one goes past the unconscious. And of course, this is a huge difference of Buddhist psychology and Western psychology, which is that Buddhist psychology doesn't concede that our instinctual unconscious, the id, you know, Freud's id, with its eros and thanatos, that that is, in principle, always remaining unconscious. In an ordinary person, it is very unconscious, and they operate with this tip of the iceberg consciousness, but, and driven, you know, impelled and impulsively and unable to control all kinds of drives and reactions and things. But the process of educating oneself toward enlightenment is to become more and more deeply conscious of that unconscious. And then Tantra takes that to the supremely subtle level of states of sleep and dream and death and deep concentration, like trance, and out-of-body type of waking dream, sort of consciously waking dream things in a subtle body, consciously doing that. So lucidly getting out of body in what is called the magic or illusion body, as well as lucid dreaming, etc. And so that the quest of Buddhahood is the quest of being totally conscious of every aspect of one's being, mental and physical, coarse and subtle. That's what that is. So, so that happens in mind isolation. For the first time, there is that experience of mind isolation. So that's when the super subtle body-mind is, in a sense, consciously inhabited by conscious dying in meditation, in such a setting that the body doesn't die, luckily, of those yogis, uh, because they, it's, it's held in a certain structure that has been created. And also there's a tradition, and there are other beings and Buddhas and things. And so, you know, it's, there's, a, there's a realm where, this, where the other astronauts, call them psychonauts, are there, and they're helping. They're connected with one. So, but by going to that, by completely surrendering through that bliss in the, to that emptiness, relativity, equivalence, then one can arise instead of co coming back out of that, like coming to sleep and waking in a coarse body, or coming to, or dying and waking and then being in a bardo, a between state, and then waking in a, in a, in a zygote if you're going to be born in a womb, or if you're in a heaven thing, you're born in a lotus by apparition, or if you go to hell, you're also born in a, a red hot iron lotus. Uh, according to them, or if you're an insect, you have a way of being born, or you're born in an egg, there are all these ways of being born. And, and um, so instead of that, you take birth as a, what's called your magic body, and you take birth and you have a between state where you are whatever the deity of your mandala that you had laboriously learned to construct in your creation stage practice, and as that deity, you then go back and forth in the fourth stage called the clear light stage. And then that's why that's called mind objective, mind isolation, and magic body. Or other translators call it illusion body because they're rude. But magic body is more, more honorific about it as it should be because it's something so extraordinary. And then in that magic body is where in a subtle plane you can accelerate Dying and being reborn and dying and being reborn and serving beings and generating merit 
and therefore developing a real Buddha body. And that's how Tantra, then, you can attain Buddhahood in a life or seven lives or 15 lives, 16 lives maximum, if you really keep this yoga. And, uh, and, that, and that's it. So then, but then in the fourth stage, once you have the magic body, then the clear light stage of the, ma- of the magic body is you have the magic body then purifies again and again the 80 instincts that are in the subtle plane of the luminous moonlit space, radiant sunlit space, and imminent darklit space. And by plunging that magic body and going through the death process again and again into clear light, that which is the fourth stage, one purifies those, in, those energies so that there are no more any driving instincts that subject you to this inner compulsions. And you become completely conscious of every kind of energy. And you, real, you realize all those energies as Buddhas and so forth. So that's the clear light stage. And then when clear light and magic body become unified, uh, although preserving in a way the duality of relative and absolute, of emptiness and relativity, uh, then that's the fifth stage, which is the communion stage, where uh, you know the, the female clear light and the male magic body in some sense, although the male magic body can be male and or female, either one, but somehow those two principles, the wisdom and art principles, uh, are in calm integration. I like to use communion, not because of some latent Christianity in my mind, but they happen to pick a good word in Latin because it's something more subtle than union. Union sort of symbolizes kind of that two things become one. And communion also does, but the calm emphasizes that they still are the two things being one. So they don't collapse it into kind of a soupy oneness. The two things are on that threshold of being the same, each enjoying being the same as the other separately, which is sort of one of the mysteries of Buddhahood, how when you become ultimate reality, when you become dharmakaya, reality body of Buddha, when you become a Buddha, you realize at that time, of course, that you, you also you have the same awareness of all Buddhas. So at some subtle level, you are all of them, and they have always been you. You just now recognize you've always been all of them. But each one gets to enjoy being all together. Is the key thing. That's your samboga, your beatific body, and your emanation body. And each one gets to deal with beings who are left behind, you know, at that temporal moment, although ultimately not left behind because you're committed to stay with them throughout all time. Because you are them in all the future time as well as past. You realize the, you realize the illusoriness of time as well. So therefore, you don't abandon the beings going into your own bliss and leave them. You, you cannot accept the state of beatitude without seeing all beings as in that state. And by seeing them in that state, you don't abandon their actual feeling about themselves where they totally don't feel like that. That would be uncompassionate. And that would be self-centered. That would be like megalomaniacal. Just because I see them as blissful, just even though they're in hell, that doesn't make them out, that doesn't get them out of hell for as far as their own subjectivity goes. So then one has to go to hell to help get them out but can do it because of the maintaining the plane of bliss at the same time. So, but I mean, well, I'm talking about the inconceivable now, so never mind. <laughs>